Now, I'm delighted to introduce on my far right, uh, Trace Mayer, who is an, uh, an entrepreneur, an investor in Bitcoin, coin, sorry. He's uh, um, uh, one of the leaders in, in thinking about and investing in, in this type of uh, new concept in currency. Um, you may have caught his uh, uh, talk yesterday, lunchtime. And then on my immediate right is James Turk, who for as long as I can remember has been a great proponent of gold as a currency instead of fiat currency. So what I've asked the panelists to do is to, in the interests of um, educating me actually as much as anybody, is to give uh, just a five, five to ten minutes on the concepts that they're talking about. Firstly, Bitcoin. Secondly, uh, gold as currency. So let's, let's have a bit of an introduction from each of them explaining what the concepts are and then we'll hopefully get into some discussion and again I'm hoping there's going to be some questions coming from the audience. So uh, Trace, if I may uh, call on you to start. Oh, thanks. Um, can you hear me fine? I, no? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Technology has been a weak point of mine. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, so I started in virtual currencies. I'm a child of the internet, you could say, uh, so decades ago. And uh, my formal education is in accounting and law. And one of the things that really has drawn me to Bitcoin is it's the first practical implementation of triple entry bookkeeping. And uh, it's a way that we're laying down property rights, not in legal code, but in software code, uh, where individuals literally hold the private keys to their own wealth, or can. And that's a very exciting uh, proposition uh, because with Bitcoin, you don't need a trusted central third party anymore in order to transfer value over distance or even to uh, have the property rights. So there, you don't need a government, you don't need banks to have property rights or to mediate the transfer of value or anything like that. And that's a very big deal in terms of history. Uh, in the Bitcoin space, I've been an early thought leader. I was first writing about, talking about it publicly when it was around five cents to a quarter. It's currently trading around $450. So in terms of absolute return, it's about twice uh, what Warren Buffett has done over the last 38 years. So that's exciting. Uh, he calls it a mirage, which I think is an inaccurate statement because Bitcoin is real in the sense that it's based on the laws of mathematics and the laws of computer science and the laws of thermodynamics. And in terms of my investments in Bitcoin, I've made investments into the Armory wallet, which is uh, the way to secure your Bitcoins. I'm very uh, paranoid of green space aliens trying to steal my Bitcoins. And so I, you know, we try to make it extremely safe and secure there. And uh, I've also invested in BitPay. I was in their seed round. They're the largest merchant processor. They're currently processing about $30 million a month of Bitcoin transactions for merchants. Uh, they will either uh, collect the Bitcoins and send those to the merchant, or they will convert it into dollars or euros, etc., and then direct deposit the next day to the merchants. And they do it as a software, as a service. So there's no more percentage of the fee like a credit card charges. They'll process uh, $5 million or more for a merchant for $3,000 a month. So it's a very disruptive uh, proposition for the payments industry, which is just one application of Bitcoin, payments and currency. We have thousands of potential applications uh, for this technology because uh, it's a new protocol layer in the internet. Uh, just like we have different stacks with TCP IP, and on top of that we have HTTP, and on top of that we have SMTP, a simple mail transfer protocol for emails. That's the rules for routing emails. Uh, HTTP, a hypertext transfer protocol. Uh, Bitcoin, you could say, is now money over internet protocol, uh, but we, we have even additional uh, applications besides just money or currency. And then my other uh, investment is in Kraken. It's the leading uh, euro exchange. We have about 60% of the euro Bitcoin pair and about 5 to 6% of global Bitcoin volume that goes through Kraken. And we deal with other cryptocurrencies there also and other fiat currencies. So we have dollars, euros, uh, Namecoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin. Uh, and when I talk about these other 
uh, potential uses, applications. Namecoin, for example, can have distributed DNS. So where we use ICANN to manage domain name servers, DNS, so when you go to yahoo.com and it points to, to Yahoo's server, uh, we, we're using a trusted third party for that. We're using ICANN. And that's who you would serve a national security letter to. And then you could, instead of someone going to Yahoo, they would end up going to some other server. And so how do we establish trust on the internet? How do we know that the party we're actually communicating to is who we want to communicate to? Uh, blockchain technology, Bitcoin being the first uh, use of this, uh, is how we, come, how we can come up with that distributed trust, that programmable trust right in uh, to, the, to the protocol layer. So it's going to be a very exciting uh, time with the development of the internet and really the reconstitution of it because the way we've built the internet to date has been based on, on an old model with a technology that uh, wasn't available. For example, Mark Andreessen, one of the leading VCs at Andreessen Horowitz, 60-plus uh, percent of the NASDAQ's market cap has come out of Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, he built the first web browser. And in the web browser, there's a 404 error, uh, page not found. Well, there's a, also a 402 error that Mark Andreessen put in 20-plus years ago, and it's payment method not specified. So they had thought about this when they were building the first web page, but the technology hadn't been invented. And that technology mm -hmm. has now been invented with Bitcoin. So it's going to mm -hmm. have a lot of implications and changes for how the internet and, and all of this works. Trace, thank you. Before I turn to James, can, can, you, can we just go back slightly, again, for my benefit as much as anybody's, can you just talk through the mechanics of how they're generated and um, and how you mine um, with bitcoins. That's my interest. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it's how deep do we want to get, because that's, uh, in the most simplest sense, uh, we have computers that are running this algorithm, this protocol, and we create what's called a blockchain. Uh, it started with the first block, the Genesis block, back in January 3rd of 2009. That was block number one. And when we make a transaction in Bitcoin, we have a public key and a private key. This is from asymmetric cryptography. Uh, the public key, anybody can know. The private key is what gives you the power or the ability to actually sign the transaction and the network will recognize it as being valid, as being following the rules of the protocol. So uh, all the Bitcoins exist in, an, in a, one of these public key addresses, and someone may or may not have the private key. And the way they get into those addresses is when you create a new block, uh, when you're mining and you, you're attempting to solve what's called a nonce, uh, you're just doing work, uh, and eventually you find one, uh, you solve the block and you will include whichever transactions uh, you want as the miner who found the block into that block. And so the transactions are the debit and the credit from one address to another. And when they get included into the block and get confirmed by the network, that's the triple entry uh, bookkeeping. That's the confirmation, the validation. And these blocks, they get layered on top of each other approximately every 10 minutes. And we're up to, I think, 260,000 blocks. And you could say that this blockchain is the DNA of Bitcoin. Uh, and it has these rules. And so that's effectively how it works. And each block is tied to the block before it uh, through mathematical law. And so you can prove mathematically all of these transactions that have ever happened in the Bitcoin network. So you can prove that that debit and that credit actually happen. And when you get the new Bitcoins in that address, you can prove that lineage through, uh, through math. And so that's very different from our current system where we have centralized entities that have a database that represents your bank account, but you can't necessarily prove that those digits uh, coming out of the computer screen are actually there. Whereas with Bitcoin, everybody has access to this blockchain, and so everybody can come to the same consensus, uh, distributed consensus, distributed trust of what the balances are. Okay. 
<laughs> and and it. <laughs> I was going to say, to, to, okay for now. To, to, to make it even. We'll come back to a couple of those points in a minute. To, to make it even more fun, it uses a Merkle root. <laughs> which Sorry? It, it uses a Merkle root for mathematics, so that's even more fun. But, I mean, you have to understand, this has been created by PhDs in, in lots of different subjects, from uh, mathematics, cryptography, uh, physics, or all the people working on this. So we have a lot of explosive intellectual uh, work that, that has gone into this. It's not a simple subject. No, clearly. Um, <laughs> But not, neither is gold mining. And I understand gold mining much better. Than <laughs> right. Um, I want to give James a, uh, a spot here. I, I understand gold. So, uh, but tell us about gold as a currency and how you've, your, your, your concepts for this and your philosophy f for this and, and the work you've done over many, many numerous years now. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about money and, and what it is, because it's important to understand the point I'm going to make about currency. You know, we use money for three different things. First of all, it's important in economic calculation. In other words, we use money to determine the prices of goods and services. Secondly, money is supposed to preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. And gold does this beautifully. An ounce of gold today buys the same amount of crude oil it did 10 years ago. You know, gold was, or back in 1999, gold was 250 and crude oil is $20 a barrel. It, bought, it buys, an ounce of gold buys the same amount of crude oil it did in 1950. Uh, in 1914, the British pound bought the same amount of commodity value that it did in 1700 when Sir Isaac Newton invented the gold standard. You know, gold does this beautifully because it follows what Milton Friedman called his K rule. This above ground stock of gold continues to grow year after year after year by approximately 1.75% per annum, which is approximately equal to world population growth and new wealth creation. So over long periods of time, you have this consistency between supply and demand of gold, and it preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. The third thing that we use money for is currency. Now, gold does not circulate today as currency because of a thing called Gresham's Law. Uh, Gresham was Sir Thomas Gresham. He was a financial advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. And he said that basically bad money drives out good. So when you have a, a money, you can either spend it or you can save it. But Gresham's Law says you spend the bad money and you save the good money. So today gold is saved and accumulated and we spend fiat currencies instead. Now the point I want to make about currencies, and this ties into Bitcoin and it also ties into my vision for gold as a form of currency. If you look back through history, currency evolves. It becomes more and more efficient. You know, you started with cattle as currency, weights of metal, eventually coins. Sir Isaac Newton invented the clipping of a coin, uh, excuse me, the milling of the edge of a coin so that you could see whether a coin was clipped or not. Then along came paper currency, which again was more efficient and less costly than moving coins. Along came wire transfers, along, uh, or before wire transfers, checking accounts, wire transfers, 1950s, uh, came plastic cards, and today we're talking about digital currency. Now, the thing about digital currency, and in fact, any improvement technology in the, in the development of currency, it's actually a good thing, because what you want to do is you want to eliminate as much as possible all of the impediments to commerce. You want to eliminate those impediments that keep us from interacting with one another. And one of the big impediments is the cost of making a payment. You know, whether you're making a payment you know, across town or across the globe, there's a cost associated with that. And each of these developments of currency have made currency more efficient and less costly, and that's what digital currency brings to the table. It's a much more efficient form of currency using today's technology. And I think that's the, the key point that I want to make. Now, there are two ways you can look at digital currency. You can do what we were doing in gold money, which is basically digital gold currency, where the gold stays in the vault and you click, using your iPhone or your computer, a weight of metal from you as the payer to some individual as the payee, the gold stays in the vault, but the ownership transfers instantaneously from the payer to the payee to make that payment. Very, very low cost and very efficient. The disadvantage is that governments don't like that. Uh, they don't like gold competing with their own currency, which is fiat currency. But you have now the development of yet another type of digital currency, which is cryptocurrencies. Now, I talk about cryptocurrencies in a general sense because Bitcoin happens to be the first mover. Whether Bitcoin is a survivor will depend on what other cryptocurrencies develop in time. But the key here is that we should all take away 
Cryptocurrencies are as important development in the, in, in the history of currency as any one of these other technological developments that I mentioned you know, over the last you know, thousand years. How it's all going to develop and play out in, in time, we will only have to wait and see. But I would like to bring one other point uh, to, to bear on this conversation, because when you're talking about gold, you cannot avoid the issue of politics. You know, in the, in the 1920s, there was a chap, a German economist by the name of Knapp, uh, K-N-A-P-P, and he came out with what was called the state theory of money. It's really the state theory of currency, because his basic point was that if you can control the currency, you can control the economy, you can then control people. Um, and we've been, at, throughout the 20th century, using the state control of currency. And I'd like to give you an example. You know, gold can be confiscated. In the 20th century, it was confiscated by Lenin in Russia, Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and Roosevelt in the United States. Now, it may seem strange to put these four politicians into one mix, or into one bunch, but they basically were all setting out to do the same thing. They all wanted to increase the power of the state and take away the power from the market, take away the power from the individual. So what we're contending with today from a big picture point of view, as we look at money and as we look at currency, the role that the government has taken over the past 100 years compared to what it was previously, and the reluctance to give up that power, and perhaps even to the extent that they're reluctant to give up that power, much like the Luddites, to the advancement of new technologies which will improve commerce and make the, reduce the impediments of, uh, to commerce by making payments more efficient and less costly. And that's where we are today. I'm a believer in the free market and I think the free market will eventually overcome and we're gonna go back to gold as the center of global commerce. After all, when Nixon, you know, gold's been money for 5,000 years and when President Nixon uh, ended the dollar's link to gold, he even said he was only uh, ending it, quote unquote, he was suspending uh, temporarily the link to gold. You know, 40 years is sort of long for a temporary point of view, but we're seeing today the imbalances in the monetary system that are as a result of that decision, and inevitably we're going to go back to gold. Governments will either do it willingly or they're going to do it kicking and screaming, being forced by the market itself. But we are going to go back to gold because the present system is essentially unsustainable. So it's going to be interesting to see how these things play out over the next few years. But clearly the technology coming to bear today has a key component that we have to think about. It's going to have an impact on the gold mining industry. Uh, it's also going to have an impact on the way we do business globally. So technological developments um, sequentially are leading to this cryptocurrency. Um, you, you're, both, you're actually in, in agreement on a number of things here, aren't you? The, 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 the ease of transfer, the ownership, um, and the costs of all this process. Um, so can the two exist um, simultaneously? Can I take that? Oh, yeah. Go yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the gold industry that Bitcoin is a competitor to gold. They're not. Bitcoin and gold are complementary, and they share a lot of common features. The guy who created Bitcoin, whoever it is, understands completely the complexities of mining gold, except that he took the geology aspects of mining gold in the real world and converted it into complex mathematical algorithms so that the above ground stock of Bitcoin grows at essentially the same rate as the above ground stock of gold. You know, the guy was obviously brilliant because he understands the way gold works and the way gold is money and why it's been money for thousands of years. So, as I see it, the two are complementary, and I don't see Bitcoin as a store of value. Uh, I see it as a currency, and I don't need to own Bitcoin to use it. So, for example, let me give you um, how this would work. Let's say I like to keep my liquidity, my cash position, primarily in gold, and I want to pay a chap in China to purchase some, some good or service. What I do is I sell some gold, buy some Bitcoin, the payment is made instantaneously, you know, for a fraction of a second, and the guy in China receives the Bitcoin, and he either automatically has his system set up so he can convert the Bitcoin back to Yuan, or make the decision that he wants to own uh, Bitcoin, or make the decision that he wants to convert to gold because he prefers to hold his liquidity in gold. This is where Bitcoin can come into play and why it's complementary to the nature of gold. It's a very, very efficient currency, and I think has the pot uh, potential to significantly reduce the cost of international commerce. And I think this is why the banks have been so reluctant to adapt it. it you know, it's estimated that the banks receive 40% of their profits from the payments business, which is essentially a no-risk business. They just collect fees for charging you 50 bucks to send a wire transfer from New York to Hong Kong. 
Um, but that's the old technology. And that's a big cost to overcome. And I think that's what these new technologies in the internet are going to do. And the interesting thing is, is that the internet is a force of disintermediation. The only thing yet to be disintermediated is the banking system. And I think that's the next target for the internet. And that's why you see a lot of venture capital money going into things like uh, the various Bitcoin initiatives. Uh, Trace knows very well some of these people in California and other places who are putting gobs of money into the, into the Bitcoin sphere. Trace, would you make a comment on that? Yeah, I'd like to... Um, gosh, how should I start with this? I told James yesterday that I was going to test his monetary history and he passed with flying colors yesterday <laughs> because he, he understood Faust. So I'm going to ask him what significance the date April 5th, 1975 might have. Ah, that's a good one. Uh, you're going to have to oh, tell so, me that. So I'm going to explain it for everybody. Um, computer programmers, like people who do on technology, we like to leave Easter eggs around all over the place. And, and eventually some people find the Easter eggs and sometimes they don't. And sometimes it takes a while to find the Easter egg. And Satoshi is no... Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who released Bitcoin synonymously, uh, nobody knows who he is. Uh, Newsweek thought they found him, thought his name was De Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto. And so we now have a joke, what is a Dorian? It's an unconfirmed Satoshi, because it didn't make it into the blockchain. Uh, <laughs> um, that's an inside joke. That's an inside joke, yeah. yeah. It's definite, <laughs> you, you, can, you can usually uh, see the depth of somebody's mind by what they laugh at and what questions they ask. Uh, and so somebody, like when Satoshi came on the scene, he went and set up a profile account at, a, at Ning, which is a peer-to-peer -peer foundation. And when you create a new, when you create a new identity, they, they would ask for a birth date. And so Satoshi put April 5th, 19, uh, 1975. And the way that the Bitcoin community found this out, about a, about a month ago exactly, somebody uh, was looking at the Wayback Machine, which takes a picture of, uh, of all the websites on certain dates, and they, they found that on his profile, his, his uh, number of years old would change, and they were able to narrow it down, and eventually they found out it was April 5th. 1975 and so they started this thread on reddit and they were asking like you know this is his birthday like why would satoshi pick april 5th 1975 as his birthday and eventually uh, i was reading through all the comments i didn't make any comments but I was, I was reading through all the comments and eventually they found out that april 5th is when executive order 6102 was issued by franklin roosevelt making the holding of gold illegal. And what happened in 1975 with Nixon uh, and making gold legal mm -hmm. for Americans to own again? Oh, I see. So it's interesting that Satoshi leaves, either chose this date completely randomly or picked it intentionally. Uh, perhaps he left an Easter egg for people. And I think what another thing that's interesting with this is uh, and James has talked about this a lot, about how we use money and currency to, to perform economic calculation. And one of the big deals with Bitcoin is that it's censorship resistant. It's our first uh, digital currency that we've made that you can't just r apply brute force to shut it down. You know, like e-gold, uh, e even gold money with uh, the payment mechanism, the regulators have brought to bear to, you know, uh, censor it economically. And so when we have this economic censorship, uh, Bitcoin being censorship resistant has a way to cut through all of that because individuals are holding the private keys to their own money. Uh, there is no government that's holding the private keys at the end of the day that can shut the bank down or that can seize the assets. And I think that what effect that this is going to have is it's going to change our concept of what a risk-free asset is. It's one that you can't seize, that you can't confiscate, that you can't steal, that you don't have an intermediary between you and it, no, ri no counterparty risk, it's equity-based. All of these are principles of Bitcoin that uh, as, as Bitcoin continues to stay around, you know, it's still here five years later, uh, you know, in another five or ten years it'll have that much more history and trust uh, behind it, and if it becomes this risk-free asset, then 
it will be able to cut through so much of all the economic censorship that we see uh, in our economies. Any types of regulation, uh, currency controls, taxes, all of these things are price controls and economic censorship. Uh, James and Gatta talk about the gold price suppression scheme that Alan Greenspan testified twice before Congress that central banks stand ready to lease gold in increasing quantities should the price rise. And it's because their power to issue what, they what we use as currency is infinitely more valuable than the price of that portfolio asset. And so they want to engage in the suppression of the price of that. They want to economically censor it, just like they wanted to uh, censor people like Copernicus with heliocentric theory and people like Galileo and uh, other people who want to talk about different ideas that are challenging to their ideas. Uh, but Bitcoin is now one of those ideas uh, or at least this concept of individuals holding the private keys to their own, own money. It's an idea uh, that may well have come and we're now living in a very exciting time of history because the technology has uh, proven itself at least so far to be censorship resistant. Like you can't just snuff it out. Trace actually hits on an interesting point. If you go back to, you know, how was money invented? It was meant invented by, you know, each and every one of us in prehistory or each and every person in prehistory in terms of understanding the need to interact in society because when you interact, you improve your status. You, you fulfill your needs and your wants, just like the person you're transacting with is fulfilling his needs and his wants when he interacts. And ultimately, money emerged from the free market. It's only within the last few hundred years, but particularly the last century, that governments have taken over this monetary process, which really should be a neutral tool in commerce. It should not be a political weapon. Because if it is a political weapon and you're actually conducting financial warfare, the economy suffers as a consequence. And if the economy suffers, each and every one of us suffer. Right, I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm going to open it up for uh, audience questions. So, um, uh, where's Martin Miriam Builder? Hopefully, you're going to be asking a question from the back there, Martin. Uh, I've got one more question here, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll open it up. Um, a workable currency needs to have liquidity. Yes. Um, what are the limits on liquidity for gold money and, and on Bitcoin? You want to go first with Bitcoin? Um, so with Bitcoin, we've currently got about $30 million a day of uh, the equivalent of Forex volume. So it's very still tiny, nascent currency. Its total market caps around $6 billion, which would put it about, uh, in terms of countries, about 100, around I think the size of Guatemala's money supply. Uh, and in terms of transactions that are actually happening, uh, uh, we estimate it's probably around 30 to 40 million dollars a day. Uh, BitPay alone processes over 30 million dollars a month of Bitcoin transactions. So, uh, still very much a small, nascent, growing uh, economy. But what do you expect for uh, magic internet money, right? <laughs> but, but isn't there some limit to growth in as much that you need uh, the computer hardware? In fact, needs to be. Oh, the computer processing power needs to be, to be growing the whole time, isn't that right? To uh, generate... No, the, the processing power, the Bitcoin network will actually self-adjust every two weeks whether the, the processing power contributing to the network is going up or going down. And that's what regulates the supply of Bitcoin. So it'll become more difficult to earn Bitcoins or less difficult. And so you don't always need the network to be growing in terms of processing power. But even in terms of processing power, that is what does secure the network. And I would say that it's vastly oversecured even today. We've got, uh, you know, if you took the 500 largest supercomputers combined, their processing power would be like one five thousandth of the Bitcoin network. I mean, it's minuscule. It's by far the largest uh, distributed computing system in the world. So it doesn't I don't think it faces too much of a threat uh, from, from processing power. And in the information age, uh, math is money. And so the Bitcoin's ability to do that math far surpasses anybody else's ability right now, unless there were a coordinated effort by some medium to large sized nation state to specifically target the Bitcoin network. And even if that were to happen, uh, 
we could make small changes to the code and make all of the hardware obsolete and then uh, move over into another cryptocurrency like Litecoin or whatever to continue the ability to transfer value over distance. So, and, and then they would have to spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to compromise that one. And then we'd make a few changes to the code and move to another one. And it doesn't cost us anything to move to the code other than whatever sunk value we had in the previous one. Uh, but we could even uh, write it so that you could move the balance, basically have the balances of your coins be able to come over into the new one. And so uh, then people wouldn't lose what they've saved in that system. So it's very much a force multiplier in that sense. James, is there any limit to using gold? Yeah. Uh, there is, there, you were talking about the growth in gold uh, production and gold uh, and, and the world population. Yeah. Well, we might have seen peak gold already. We've heard today how difficult it is to find new good depo gold deposits. Grades are lower and all that. So I, I don't, I'm limit? not a believer of the peak gold theory. Um, you know, the technology always comes along to enable us to continue growing this above ground stock for 1.75% uh, uh, per annum. And I wrote a, a monograph um, last year called uh, The Above Ground Stock of Gold, Its Importance and Its Size, and traced it back to 1492 and showed how we keep growing this above ground stock of gold. Uh, I mean, you know, today you have mines in Nevada where the old timers in the 1980s walked across it because they thought it was dirt. But the technology of heat bleaching changed everything and technology will continue to change things. Um, so I, can, I believe that we will continue to, to grow this above ground stock of gold. Another statistic that's interesting is, you know, a hundred years ago, to explain this technology point, in South Africa, you could sink a shaft maybe a thousand feet or, uh, and uh, it would cost this much gold. Well, today it still costs this much gold, but the technology allows you to go down three meters. Um, three, uh, three kilometers uh, on the same weight of gold because the technology has improved so much over time. It's just one of these you know, characteristics of gold preserving purchasing power to do things over long periods of time. But in terms of the liquidity point, um, you know, gold is the opposite of Bitcoin, which is understandable. Gold's been around for 5,000 years. Bitcoin's been around for five years. You know, gold is, wor is really one of the world's most liquid assets. But I will say that there's some provisos on that. And I'm speaking here, someone who's been involved in the gold industry uh, for several decades. Um, and I used to manage a uh, sovereign wealth fund for one of the very wealthy Middle Eastern countries. So I'm used to dealing in gold in size and seeing the market over many different types of conditions. The general rule of thumb is it's very easy to sell gold in size, but very hard to buy gold in size. And that's particularly true today. You know, if you want to buy a couple tons of gold today, to have it delivered immediately is almost impossible to do because the market is just so tight. But this is a usual set of circumstances at the moment, evidenced by the fact that we've been in backwardation for most of the time since July. But generally speaking, gold is a very liquid asset. It's, changed, it's exchanged 24-7 against the various currencies of the world. It's not used too often as a form of currency in terms of spending. But if you want to buy real estate in Vietnam, for example, you actually have to use gold to buy real estate. Oftentimes you have to use gold to rent space in the bazaar in Ist Istanbul. But more often than not, it's just used as a means of saving, although it is exchanged frequently for national currencies. So there's no restrictions whatsoever in using gold as a form of currency and having a lot of liquidity for that reason. Okay. Are there any questions from the, the audience? Martin, you do have a question. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Well, it, it, I'll turn it into a question. Um, I mean, there's so much um, that uh, I certainly, and I, it sounds like you and maybe many others here, uh, don't understand about Bitcoin. Um, so I, I, I want to ask a kind of a practical uh, question, um, thinking that, you know, in the real world, we're, you know, uh, with all due respect to the miners here, we're run by lawyers, mm -hmm. okay? Everything is contractual, okay? And, and so the question comes down to, if I make a contract with another party to pay in Bitcoin, and it turns out that the contract doesn't work, or I'm not happy with the service that's been provided, right? What is my recourse? Particularly if governments do not recognize Bitcoin as the legal currency of the land. So that's, in essence, where, where I'm having a, a problem. And we have the same small problem, if you will, with gold. See, we can, we can transact gold for currency because we have contracts that are set in the currency of that uh, jurisdiction. 
if Bitcoin is not in any jurisdiction, how would I get legal recourse? Simple yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, it, it should constitute uh, property under most, uh, most countries' property laws. Uh, but, you know, I think we're also getting to another interesting aspect of Bitcoin that I haven't talked about, and uh, that's the concept of smart property. We can actually build contracts into the Bitcoin protocol. And so you can build your, your contract right in there and you can have the, the remedy uh, specified and it can all be executed by software code. Um, so, and all of that had to be designed into Bitcoin uh, before uh, it was really re released out into the wild. And a lot of those functionalities haven't been built out yet. Uh, but one functionality that uh, we just finished uh, building out in Armory is what's called multi-signature. And with multi-signature, instead of having one private key that you can sign to move the Bitcoins, you can specify, say, three of seven. And so it, in that script, you, you require three out of seven uh, signatures to sign in order to move the Bitcoins. So, or you could do two out of three, and then it would be the, the buyer, the seller, and an arbitrator, for example. And so then you could uh, be engaging in a little bit more of private law and alternative dispute resolution for your, for your contracts and for your remedies, which then under the New York Convention could be applied uh, and be binding in over 150 countries. So, I mean, I think your question was a much more practical one than theoretical, but I hopefully I answered it where, you know, theoretically we can build out a lot of things in the Bitcoin protocol to automate the whole process, but in the meantime, we can also uh, be creative in how we use the currently existing tools to also uh, affect an outcome that we may want. Okay, a follow-up follow question is, I, and I'm not entirely sure of, um, of this, but I, I thought I saw some headlines with respect to China not allowing contracts to be settled in Bitcoin. Is, is, did I understand that? or um, I'm not sure exactly what's the so you're, you're running right head to head. With yeah, I mean, I'm not government sure. prerogative. I'm not sure what the true state of the Chinese position is on it. Uh, there's a lot of. It was the banks were prohibited from using Bitcoin, but it didn't. It didn't stop private contracting in Bitcoin. Yeah, but yeah. if the banks, if but, the banks but, are prevented, then then I come back to my original question with respect to legal contract. How do I get restitution if I'm unhappy? Well, there, there's also a lot of disinformation and misinformation that's put into the market to shape public opinion and uh, market sentiment. So a lot of that news could actually just be completely false <laughs> so, that, okay. so that traders can get the Chinese or get other people to sell their Bitcoins cheap. Uh, and at least from the, the people that run exchanges over in China that I've talked to, uh, that they've, I mean, they're still trading over there, and but I do think that the banks are prohibited from having Bitcoin denominated accounts or engaging in uh, Bitcoin financial instruments, but they can still bank the Bitcoin exchanges, from what I, from what I understand. And, and with regard to the restitution issue, if you have, for example, under Anglo-Saxon common law in a UK jurisdiction, a contract and you're required to fulfill under that contract, regardless what that contract says, regardless what currency that contract uses, you can bring it to a UK court and expect restitution under the terms of that contract. Thank you, Martin, for that question. Are there any pressing questions for, we have a couple here, great. Uh, being an accountant and understanding double entry accounting, uh, I kind of like the idea of a triple entry accounting, but there's one thing that uh, recently was in news with Bitcoin was the missing Bitcoins. Uh, and I think it's in Japan. So you said distributed trust, but you also said that, uh, you know, if every debit it's a credit, we understand that part. But you also said with the algorithms, you could trace the origin and where it is. How come you can't trace where that money disappeared, that Bitcoin disappeared? Yeah, so all of those customers, uh, they trusted Mt. Gox with the private keys, and they sent the Bitcoins to Mt. Gox, and uh, Mt. Gox didn't necessarily tell them where they were sending the Bitcoins from there. They didn't, 
submit to audits. Uh, it's very ironic that we would, Satoshi would release something that removes the need for a trusted third party and the first thing the Bitcoin community does is create a trusted third party. And, and then it's not really a surprise that that trust got abused. We have seen that trust be abused with, uh, with gold storage, with dollars, with euros. Uh, etc. MF Global, MF Refco, Global, regulated Refco, entities. Bank of America, Lehman Brothers. I mean, uh, there's a reason we have a lot of this regulation in place, and uh, and you know, Mt. Gox just abused the trust. But it what? It's not a problem of the Bitcoin protocol. It's the problem that individuals trusted somebody that they shouldn't have trusted, and they learned after the fact. Uh, I didn't lose anything in Mt. Gox. I didn't trust them. No, had no reason to. Uh, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, I think we have, uh, I'll take one more question over there and then we ought to wrap things up. Thank you. No, we don't have a question now, okay. Just wanted to say hello to you. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, we've got, sorry, yes, sorry. sorry you, yeah, that gentleman there had his hand up earlier for, so I'll take that one. Do you want a quick one? Oh, he passed. Sorry. We're all passing now. Oh, here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we, we've known that uh, gold has been around for thousands of years as money, and so it gave our politicians and central bankers enough time to come up with ways to counterfeit, or, excuse me, to print money. Um, and the solution in, in the case of gold, of course, has been the supply of paper gold. Uh, and uh, I guess Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies haven't been around for long enough and politicians are still trying to figure out what to do with them. And um, so that, that's one reason why I think cryptocurrencies are probably the closest proxy to where the gold price would be in a free market. And it would be interesting to see um, maybe cryptocurrencies uh, or an index of cryptocurrencies compared to uh, James's um, fair price of gold, where it should be. Uh, but my question is really, um, how will politicians react to the rise of cryptocurrencies and come up with ways to counterfeit them? And probably w one, of, one of the ways people, people are considering is quantum computers. So how, how do you, you, you talked about computing power earlier, so how would you react to the possibility if, if, if quantum computers, and the NSA is probably already working on one, um, becomes a reality, how could that um, become a threat to, um, to cracking cryptocurrencies and, and counterfeiting them? Yeah, I mean it could become a potential threat. None of the core developers on Bitcoin and the community is not really worried about it at all right now because it's not even on the horizon. Uh, but we've seen with previous uh, encryption algorithms, in a lot of cases we see uh, the threat coming long in advance and we're able to make modifications and changes to uh, advert that. And we can do the same thing with Bitcoin. We could switch uh, from like SHA-256 to SHA-512 if we needed to, or we could switch uh, to a whole different encryption algorithm, uh, although that might require a little bit more consensus from everyone in the network. Uh, but we've seen that when there is a threat posed to Bitcoin as a whole, uh, for about a year ago exactly, there was an inadvertent hard fork to the network, which it was about the worst thing that could possibly happen. And everybody who was somebody in the community, their cell phones lit up with text messages. Everybody converged in the Bitcoin development channel on IRC. Uh, within 23 minutes, the problem had been identified. A potential solution had been floated. Uh, well, several potential solutions. The solution that would have the least effect on the, the average user uh, was decided upon. All the key decision makers that were needed to uh, agreed to that course of action. And within about five and a half to six hours, uh, the, the, the inadvertent hard fork was brought back and there was really no uh, significant effect on any average user. 
and there were some people who were negatively affected and uh, a charity fund had been created uh, that rewarded them for what they had lost or would have potentially lost had they not chosen that plan of action willfully. And so, you know, you got to keep in mind that there, there are a lot of people with a lot at stake in Bitcoin, and even though it's a distributed trust consensus network, uh, if there is any threat to it, whether it's technological or political or whatever, uh, a lot of these minds get very focused very quickly on figuring out what that threat is and how to neutralize it. If I could just add one thing to that, you know, based on today's technology, it's impossible to crack the algorithm that drives Bitcoin. Could that change in five years? Yes, you know, the future is unpredictable. We just don't know how technology is going to develop. But you can say the same thing about gold. Nobody today knows how to turn lead into gold. Could that change in five years? Yeah, in theory, supposedly it could. You know, there's nothing in the world that's risk-free. You just have to keep abreast of, you know, what is undervalued and continue to position yourself uh, and those things that work for you. Thank you. Um, one final question. I think the bus is going to leave. Patrick, yes, it's what's me. What it's just two very short questions. One simple one is... How are you financing yourself? I mean, where do you make your profit? Is it on transaction? Is it uh, collection fees or what is it? How is it? And second question is uh, bank secrecy and money laundering. I mean, is there any way for governments really to monitor every single transaction? Go ahead. Uh, I'm just an independent uh, entrepreneur and investor in the companies I invest in. They have their own business plans. Uh, in terms of like regulation with regards to anti-money laundering and know your customer, uh, BitPay and Kraken, which both interface with customers, they have AML policies that they follow and uh, everything like that and try to be compliant and they work with regulators. Uh, in terms of the Bitcoin network, uh, it's just a mathematical algorithm, so it doesn't care about any of that. and you can't really serve a mathematical algorithm with a subpoena or take it to court. And even if you did, like, what are you going to do, shoot it? Like, you can't solve a math problem with violence. So at the end of the day, uh, it's censorship resistant in that regard. And so the network's either censorship resistant and immune to that violence, or it's not. And so far, it's proven to be immune to that violence. Uh, that would be exerted by state actors or drug cartels or whoever it is. Uh, and if Bitcoin is not immune to that and, and an attack vector is found that it's not immune to, then it's just not fit for purpose uh, as a censorship resistant medium. And generally speaking, with regard to profits, if you accept the notion that Bitcoin is a currency, you can make profits on Bitcoin the same way you make profits on a Swiss franc or profits on a year or the profits on any currency. You provide services related to that currency that make it more useful, give it a higher utility to the people uh, to encourage them to use that Bitcoin and pay you for that service. You make a profit and stay in business. Thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to have to call it a, an evening there because the first bus leaves at 20 past, the second one at 25 to 11. Um, thank you very much. Uh, will you please thank our speakers, Trace and James. Thank you.